Today I'm going to finally learn about my ancestry because I don't really know a whole lot. I know my family can be traced back somewhere to like England, Scotland, Wales, and maybe some Nordic countries. But the problem with this old DNA test that I took is it was more of a range. Like there was a chance that I didn't actually come from Germanic Europe. But this video is called Uncovering Drudenell's Danish Immigration Ancestry. I let Jarrett Ross here, a professional genetic genealogist, dive deep into my family's history. I'm a little scared. I don't really know what's going to pop up. I guess I'm Danish though. 1851. Falster Island, Again. Denmark. Oh, wow. A 16-year-old... I'm already so shocked about this. I'll be honest, I don't remember really hearing much about my family's history. I know my grandma was born in Salt Lake City and was maybe a part of a Mormon family. A musician named Hans is walking home after being the lone musician to play music at a party in a nearby town. Nice. Something he had been doing Based. since the age of 12. <laughs> As Hans walked down the street, violin in hand, he overheard a conversation about some American priests who'd come to town. Hmm. These priests were preaching about a new religion. So I'm guessing that there's I have some sort of relation to this man, maybe. Founded in America, for which they had just finished translating their religious uh, text so to Danish. Really? So this is a Mormon traveling to Denmark. This new religion was quite intriguing to Hans and would become the catalyst to greatly change I'll be his honest. future, leading him and his siblings to travel. I don't know anything about Mormonism, like, I, <laughs> maybe my grandma does, but I don't. Travel over 5,200 miles to build a new life. I just know the, you know, the basic stuff. The Hello, bikes. everybody. I am Jarrett Ross, the Genie Vlogger, and on today's video, I will be discussing Drew Durnell's Mormon pioneer ancestry. <laughs> this is so crazy. Oh, 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 wow. Yeah, this was like the most awkward photo I've ever taken in my life. Drew Durnell is a geography, history, and gaming YouTuber who has been making videos for just over 10 years. I first yep. learned about Drew when I did a reaction to his this DNA is... test results in May of 2021, and then we had the chance to this meet while VidCon that in 2022. I was showing. While at VidCon, I asked Drew what he knew about his family, and while he knew a good bit, it seemed to be somewhat hazy. Definitely hazy. I mean, I can think back. I was lucky enough to live with my great grandma for a time. She told me a lot of stories, but I, you know, I was so young. I, I really don't remember that much. I offered to research his tree for the series and he accepted. He sent me his DNA results in a basic family tree and then I was off researching. Man, this As is so cool. As I was cool. reviewing what he sent me, I quickly noticed something interesting with Drew's tree. When Drew was born, he not only had five great grandparents still alive, wow. but he also oh, had yes, two- Oh, yes, yes. Like I said, I was very- And I lived with my great-grandma, this lady, Vera May Russell. Second great-grandmother's alive as well. She lived for a long time, so I've always been super thankful for that. One of those second great-grandmothers was through Drew's purely maternal line, so I decided to yeah. ask him what he knew about this line of his family. Oh, yeah. So I consider myself to be extremely lucky <laughs> I just because covered I all was this. fortunate at a young age to live with both- both my grandma and her mom, my great grandma. So I was able to obtain pretty good amount of information. Obviously, a lot more from my grandma Linda. Uh, but the basics to her upbringing was that she was born in Salt Lake City, and she might have been raised Mormon. I'm still not entirely yeah, sure she, about that one. She definitely wasn't Mormon later in life, but maybe as a kid. When it comes to as far as my great grandma, her mom, this one's a little bit more difficult. I do remember certain things. Uh, that she would tell me at a young age. I also remember her teaching me a lot about the history of America. Yeah, I do think that I credit her with the reason why I'm such a geography nerd. Hearing about the Mayflower from her, that was probably the first time I'd heard of that ship. She would teach me a little bit. She uh, talked about World just, War II a lot. Just about history. I mean, again, I was like eight years old, so this was going right over my head. In general, and maybe that's where... And that honestly might be what sparked my interest. Yeah. Um, again, I don't know why she was telling like a six or seven year old this stuff, but I guess I find it, I found it fascinating. I still don't really know. I always ask other family members. Apparently she did a lot during World War II. Like she went to Europe multiple times and I think she was working in like, it was definitely with planes. It was definitely certain plane manufacturers, Boeing or something like that. Left an impact. So I know some pieces of information, but obviously I would definitely like to know a lot more. Oh yeah. Drew's great-grandmother Vera was born on May 18th, 1927 in Salt Lake City to Stanley Pitts Russell and Iva Hattie Weston Scow. <laughs> this Vera's is crazy. I was actually just asking my, well, how do you say that? My grandma's brother, so I, is that uncle? About what he remembered about his grandma and his great-grandma. Maybe some of this will ring a bell. Their Stanley was a first-generation American with both of his parents having been born in England. 
Oh, wow. Was- wow. That's crazy. So my great, great grandpa was first generation. That doesn't go as far back as I thought. I thought we had been here for a minute. Vera's father, Stanley, was a first generation American with both of his parents having been born in England. Wow. Vera's mother, Iva Hattie, who also went by Hattie or Harriet, was born in Utah in 1907. I think I remember hearing about this this lady's name, actually. John Weston Scow and Susanna Cheshire. I'm like trying to map this out in my head. If I have heard from the older generations this name, I think I did. The fourth of 11 children. Dang! Wow, and there's a lot of, uh, they had a ton of daughters. Only three boys. Stanley and Harriet were legally married in Utah in 1928, which I realized their marriage was almost one year after Vera had been born. Hmm. I couldn't find anything which indicated the deeper story, but I would later learn that it wasn't uncommon for couples from their church to have marriages that were recognized by the church before having their legally civil marriage. Granted, that seemed to be more of a 19th century thing, and I don't know if that was actually the case here. Hmm. Stanley and Harriet would go on to have two more children, a son and another. That is a crazy picture. I love the old car in the background. Another daughter. Stanley worked as a roof shingler in Salt Lake City, but in the late 1930s, the family moved to Compton in Los Angeles. Dang, dang, I'm from Compton, I knew it. (laughs) Wow, that's crazy. Actually, I just now remember my grandma used to say all the time that she loved Compton. So, (laughs) that is not a joke. That is so funny. To work various jobs throughout the years. In the 1940s, Stanley was working as a truck driver for Ream Manufacturing Company at their Southgate factory. Then in a 1942 city directory, he was listed as a shipyard worker. Hmm. And by 1950, he was back to roofing again. Stanley would pass away in 1972. Yeah, I mean, I obviously never met him. My great grandpa, I mean, I wasn't even close. Patty would pass away in 1994. Oh, wow. I mean, I could have met her. I don't think I did. I was two years after Drew was born. Both of Harriet's Dang. parents were born in Utah, which made sense because Drew had told me that he believed this line of the family had been part of the Mormon church. So my next step was to confirm if that was true. Lucky for our research, the Mormon Church, or what they, they documented it called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which sometimes just goes by the LDS Church, are heavily involved in genealogy. Oh, wow, now, that's this cool. This is connected to the LDS Church's belief in proxy baptisms, which are basically baptizing already deceased people. Hmm. So genealogy allows you to build your family tree and baptize your ancestors. Wow. The LDS Church is also the largest holder of genealogical records in the world, oh, even dang. housing the largest archive of records in a mountain vault known as the Granite Mountain Records Vault. There are census That's records crazy. for church members Keep it in like a big old vault like that. so we can easily see if they were part of the church. Vera's family shows up in these various church records, and I even found Vera in the 1935 church census records This connection to the church likely meant that the family already had an extensive family tree built out. And even more likely, it was being hosted on the church's genealogy website, Family Search. Their side of the family was like super more, there's a lot, there's a lot, oh well, like he was saying, they might have been baptizing post, uh, what's that called? After death? Which is a free website which hosts billions of digital records, as well as a collaborative family tree. A collaborative Thanks. family Here's tree good. means Again, that everyone please go works in the same family tree. So if two people video. end up putting the same person in their family trees, that is then merged together. Mm. This is actually the same type of thing that Genie.com and Wikitree do as well. That makes sense. But being that Family Search is the LDS Church's website, it has become the central hub of the three collaborative trees with the most information on LDS Church families. I quickly found the family in the family search tree and the amount of information connected to the tree. Yeah, I know some of these people. I don't know who has it all, but uh, I remember my great grandma Vera. She like hoarded a lot of stuff. And uh, if I can only find that stuff, she probably has old pictures somewhere. Actually, my parents might have that stuff. I should have looked for that. <laughs> Extremely expansive with photographs. Yeah, I know that my great grandma's uh, husband died like really young. She never remarried. He just like had a heart attack on the couch and unique records attached the first thing to catch my eye was that harriet's paternal grandparents were born in denmark 
Wow. So, I, so we have my great grandfather's side born in England, and then my great grandma's side, great great grandma's side. Yeah, great. Add one more great in there. Born in Denmark. That's there. really interesting because every time I would talk about my uh, Nordic ancestry, whenever that would come back with that data, I always, as you probably should, you go back to like the you know the Viking days, you know when the Viking invasion of the British Isles was happening, because a lot of people from the British Isles have lineage to the Nordics because of the Vikings. But to see that there was a direct line, not even that far away, it's like wow to their story it's not like i'm just one percent harriet's grandfather from the nordic countries Hans i guess olson weston scow can i do the percentages now i mean this is only one line of my tree but since we now have data on this 25 16 i think like seven percent of me is is danish I, it, is that the right I, I don't know if i math that right drew's fourth great grandfather was a well-documented figure in the lds church history and had led quite an interesting life. Hmm. 1835. This also gives interesting uh, perspective on like the Civil War times. If they're in Utah, I don't really know what they was doing. They was just chilling over here doing nothing in the Utah Territory, I guess. Olson Weston Scow was born on the 17th of September, 1835, in a town on. This is actually so Island funny because I just watched the Book of Mormon uh, <laughs> in London. Oh man. In Denmark, as just Hans Ulison, Hans the son of Ula. The name Westenskow came from the word Western Westenskov, which was something Hans's father Ule had been nicknamed as it roughly. Man, this is so Western. cool. I, I feel so happy to be getting this information. Woods, because Ule is said to have lived in the western wards of the town. Hans came from a very musical family, with his father Ule being a professional musician who taught many on Falster Island, including Hans and his siblings. Hans started learning violin at the age of seven. By age nine, he was playing dances alongside his father. Hmm. By the age of 12, he was playing parties all by himself. That is cool. I did, I was playing in a band before I really started YouTube. I liked music a lot. I guess this is Hans's brother Peter connection here. The same with the brothers traveling to neighboring towns to play parties and dances. When Hans was born, his family was part of the Lutheran church. While Hans hadn't been very religious, he did have a few religious experiences in his youth. On one occasion, Hans was walking home from playing a dance in a neighboring town when something all of a sudden overpowered him. Oh, wow. It was about a mile away from where I lived. On my way Ooh, home, it comes to good... me that I was overpowered of some unseen power which I cannot hear describe. It's nice voice I did pray here. earnestly to the Lord for the first time for his help, and my prayer was answered, and it all left me. Yeah, this sucks. I've never been to Denmark. I was close to going to Denmark, but then I didn't see a reason why <laughs> at the time. <laughs> Kept my prayer from that time. I guess I need to go now. This day. There was another story of Hans coming home after a dance and hanging his violin on the wall before going to sleep. His mother and sister were standing next to his bed when they claimed the violin slowly floated up mm. and away from the wall and then back to the wall going back and forth three times. They told Hans about this when he woke up, and his mother said that she believed it was a sign from God that he would do something mm. in the music field. In Hans' autobiography, he talks about the first Dang, time he has an autobiography. in 1851, and he right, says, This is clearly a big member of the I always Mormon church, I guess. Mormonism from that time until I embraced it. It wasn't until years later in 1862 that Hans and his brother were baptized into the Mormon church. Wow. At that point, Hans... In Denmark? I'm wondering, like, or did he go to... When did he go to Utah? Married for a few... Oh, no, I don't think he... Maybe he doesn't. ...years and had a one-year-old son named Ulla. Just a year later in 1863, Hans left for Utah with oh, his wife... there you go. ...who's pregnant... And son. Wow, Hans's what a time to go to the U.S. I guess we're going to get into this. Brother Peter had been called to serve in the Danish army to fight Germany over the Schleswig-Holstein I was region. going to, I Germany. was literally just thinking about this, like, oh, wow, that brings a whole new context to that war. For only 10 weeks, but fighting in eight battles. Wow. Shortly after Peter finished his service in the army in oh, he 1864, didn't die. he left for America. 1864, a year later. Their sister Magdalena, who also went by Lena, would join them just a few months later. Something especially important to Lena is she had promised their mother on her deathbed that she would stay with her brothers. While this was all turning out to be quite an interesting story, I wanted to understand the overall history connected to this. So I had a lot of questions to answer. 
What yeah. were Mormon priests doing in Denmark yeah, that's, in 1850? That is so How interesting. How long have they been there? They were By clearly learning the larger history of the area. That might be helpful in understanding Hans's story. They must have been sending so out I missions. Out I mean, they do missions still, but to see that they were doing missions in the 1800s, crazy that the LDS Church only was founded in 1830. So all this happened like two decades, two to three decades. They were already going to Denmark recruiting people. To Professor Lynn Henriksen from Brigham Young University to help me understand oh, BYU. The history That's right. a bit better. Hello, my name is Lynn Henriksen. I'm a retired professor of linguistics and English. I've language always liked Jets. BYU's football team. I will say that. Brigham Young University. <laughs> I love college football. As you might guess from my last name, Henriksen. I am Scandinavian, Danish. Mm. So uh, I've had a, an interest in my Danish ancestry for many years. And that led me to do research on uh, Danish immigrants to Utah. As a uh, language learning teaching professor, I've studied many languages in my career. People always say, you're a linguist, so how many languages do you speak? And linguists don't like that question because <laughs> most of them speak just one or two. That's funny. And they look at other aspects of language. But I have studied different languages, about nine. The oh, last wow. one of all has been Danish, my ancestral language. Wow. And so that began I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. I'm remembering all the memes about Danish language, something about like it sounds like there's a potato in your throat. That's so funny because now that comes back to me. <laughs> Apparently, studying that language allowed me to create this specialty on Danish immigrants What's really... in the United States. So that's oh, wow. where... Uh, the connection becomes between linguistics. What's really cool about what Jared did here is like, it's cool that he went down. This is my pure maternal line. So my mom's mom's mom, she just went straight down. That's exactly, we're following that all the way down. The immigration with these uh, Danish immigrants that came to Utah. My first question for Professor Henriksen was what was the general religious life like in Denmark and how accepted were these Mormon missionaries? Well, I think Denmark was Protestant. Uh, for centuries, uh, Denmark and the other Scandinavian were Lutheran. It wasn't yeah. until 1850 that the Danish constitution was amended to allow for freedom of religion. Mm. And that led to an opening for representatives of other religions to come in and proselytize. And among them were the missionaries, we say Mormon, uh, the official name of the church is uh. the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The church leaders were actively sending out missionaries to, to the world. The church was uh, organized in 1830 yeah. and sent missionaries out immediately to the eastern United States from New York. That is crazy. I mean, that is so fast to be immediately like, boom, let's get everyone in this. By the 1840s, they'd uh, gone to England and converted thousands there who'd come to the, many of whom had come to the United States. By this time, the, the Latter-day Saints had been moved from New York to uh, Ohio to Illinois mm. to Missouri. They got pushed further and, and further out east bumped or west. Across west. the plains to Utah. Wow. In 1847. Settled on Salt Lake City. This is random, but uh, one of my, I remember just my grandma's, just my mom's mom. She always wanted to return and live out the rest of her life in Salt Lake City. That's something that she always would say. She loved Salt Lake City. Despite their difficult circumstances in a new land, and they started sending missionaries out again. A rash of snow was one, and a Peter O. Hansen, a Latter-day Saint who had joined the church in the United States. He was an American, but he had Danish ancestry. I think he might have been born in Denmark. They were the first missionaries to go to Denmark. Wow. That was in 1850, and they had great success, and priests and other missionaries were sent. Professor Henriksen also discussed yeah. how the translation it's crazy how of the successful Book of they were in recruiting. Danish made a huge impact on conversions in Denmark. Uh, you asked about the Book of Mormon, and that was uh, a new experience uh, when they uh, first missionaries went to I think we're talking about the stage New England <laughs> and uh, the United States and up into Canada they preached in English they spoke English but mm. when they got to Scandinavia English wouldn't do and that's so interesting I mean obviously at this time the 1800s Scandinavia was not teaching as a second language English nowadays I mean what 90 percent of the population speaks English so this was the, really the first experience in the church history where they the missionaries had to learn new languages wow so when, yeah, I had to Danish should be a difficult one. The, the Book of Mormon over into Danish, and Peter O'Hansen was the guy who did that. Wow. And that was part of his work, you know, get up every morning and translate a portion of the English Book of Mormon into Danish. Wow. That I also does asked not sound why fun. They likely joined the <laughs> that church. sounds very, very difficult. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be that difficult if you were taught a couple different languages at a young age, but... And eventually decided to migrate to America. When I read the, uh, the history of Hans Westenskow, and he had some spiritual experiences. Rather unusual, the violin Floating. falling off the wall. Yeah. But a lot of people did have spiritual experiences. Others were attracted by the doctrine that was preached. They then uh, 
in many cases, left their homeland and came to the United States and eventually to Utah, to Salt Lake City. That would be the, the arrival point. Hmm. The first that is a Dan- long journey. You think about that in the 1800s from Denmark, uh, you're probably going over to New York, and then from New York, you need to take a carriage or horses all the way out to Salt Lake City. Seems years, like kind of a dangerous journey, to be honest. Converts sure was at this time to the Latter Day Saint Gospel. The first four principles of the gospel we say are faith, repentance, baptism, and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is not too unusual in Christian churches. But they also added a fifth one, which was uh, gather to Zion. So there was a real need for people felt pressure and the need because of the Latter Day Saint idea that this is the latter day. These are the latter days. Christ is coming soon, mm. and we need to gather to be in a safe place. 46,000 that converted. Utah Scandinavian population, wow. Most were from Denmark and then Sweden, Norway. Norway started getting their numbers up a little bit, but not that much. At least 26,000 migrated to Utah. And in those days, Utah didn't have Wow, so this guy, I think we're talking about my great-great-grandpa or great-great-great, I don't know, three, but he must have been one of the first, one of these 1800s. So this was quite an increase in the population. There was two they in 1850. Uh, 9% of the population, which is a pretty large minority. There this are really explains why, why economic demographics wise, Utah is an extremely, uh, <laughs> it's very uh, European, I guess this is how to phrase that. We call push pull factors. So some factors pull them towards the uh, United States and Utah, like the promise of economic uh, success and the gospel, the gathering to Zion idea. There are other things like uh, persecution. Once they joined hmm. a non-Lutheran church, many of these people found they were persecuted or at least ostracized. Hmm. My great grandfather joined the church and worked uh, managing a brickyard. Man, look at that guy's mustache. Said, That's well, crazy. If you want to be the manager of this brickyard, you have to have your children baptized in the Lutheran church. And so, so he eventually said, well, I'm going, I'll leave. And so Did the combination of factors led a lot of people to come to Utah. Hans's trip to Utah was only briefly mentioned in his own writings, but his sister Lena documented her own trip quite well Ooh. in 1864. Ooh. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That is The Mormon missionaries helped fund Lena's trip with something called the Perpetual Emigration. Man, they must have had some money, because this, this would cost a lot, I feel. Bring all these people back to Utah. The group Lena traveled with had about 350 people altogether, all of whom were described as converts. Putting them in the bottom of the ship, maybe? They first sailed to England, taking a three-day trip, which had heavy rain almost yep. the entire The North time. Sea is not a good place to go. That's what I keep seeing TikToks about that. The North Sea is terrifying. Making many of them sick. They landed on the east coast of England and took a train to Liverpool before continuing their journey to America. Man, I don't even like to do 12-hour plane rides. Can you imagine this? This is definitely taking like six weeks. America had 974 at passengers, and Lena described the ship's crew as rough and ill-tempered. Hmm. I mean, Lena had befriended yeah, some- I think I'd be too if I was on a ship all the time like that. They were all conned on the trip by an elderly man who pretended to be a missionary Ooh. and said they could entrust him to keep their valuables safe. Oh. Instead, after they gave him their valuables, he disappeared yeah. and was never seen again. Oh, yeah. I'm not surprised. There's probably a lot of people did that stuff. After a grueling two-month journey, Lena's group landed at Castle Garden in New York. They then traveled by steamboat to Albany before taking a train west. Wow. The converts weren't well treated on this trip, and because this was during the Civil War, the group yep. found themselves in cattle cars so the active soldiers could take the nicer cars. Ah. Uh, Once they arrived at the Missouri I'm River, assuming they stayed they out of the South at this time, probably. Another steamboat or anywhere up near to the, Wyoming. The fighting. In Wyoming, they then joined a company of immigrants led by missionary William B. Preston and then had to travel the last 1,000 miles on foot. Oh my goodness. Every once in a while, Lena would pull out her Crazy. violin to play for everybody. Along the way, Lena fell in love with a man named Marcus Funk, and they would be engaged before the trip's end. Wow. They finally made it That's to their That's one way to bond with someone. <laughs> Going through a journey like that, walking 1,000 miles. And on September 15th, 1864, having started their trip on April 22nd, 1864. 
taking just under five months to travel about 5,200 miles. Five months, okay, yeah, uh, that's a lot longer than six weeks. That wouldn't be fun. It was expected that the road to Zion would be a difficult one, yep. that God's people should go through much tribulation oh, to become be purified tough. as gold. With this understanding, I mean, clearly, all yeah, were you, determined to bear with that weakness that which seemed gold. to be their lot, going forward to their ultimate reward, a home in Zion. Wow. Just to be so determined to get this there for five months. This was a pretty months, common that's... experience for these Danish immigrants, but they did have somewhat of an idea before leaving of what to expect. And again, and these were some of the first ones I bet you got a little bit easier through the other decades, 1870, 1880, probably got bit by bit easier, but they were some of the first. To help them prepare for the travel and for assimilation, they had English classes, in Denmark mm. before they came. Oh, that's they a smart idea. Start teaching them English on the trip. In Danish for them to help them know as they were traveling mm. across the ocean and across the plains and so forth, what to expect, what to come prepared with. Most of them went on ships maybe to, to Liverpool, which was a, a major disembarkation point from the continent or from, from Europe. The early ones, I guess, went on sailing ships, but more often in the later years, after the 1850s, they came on steamships. And they would arrive mm. either in yeah. New York City or Boston, perhaps. And in many cases, they would go all the way down and then come up the Mississippi River to St. Louis. The early uh, arrivals had to walk or go by horseback or wow. in wagons, in the, the covered wagons we see in cowboy movies, up until 1869. One interesting thing it's about like the, the Oregon Danish Trail. immigration <laughs> in the years before the railroad it's was that, that they were known for using hand carts, which were small wagons with no horse, no ox, just a man or a woman or both. Wow. Maybe their children pushing and pulling. There's These people had to be buff. Children's Mormon hymn called so, "For some must push and some must pull, as we go marching up the hill and and barely on our way we go until we reach the valley." Oh, yeah, singing would. Singing probably makes the journey a little bit more bearable. Hans had <laughs> arrived almost something. exactly one year prior to his sister Lena. Hans mentions in his autobiography that he paid for the passage of thirteen others. 11 in Falster and two more in Liverpool. Was that $150? Arrived I wonder what that translates to. $1850, $150? I mean, that's thousands. In Newark on June 13th, but weren't allowed ashore until June 15th. They quickly boarded a train to that's Albany probably and arrived 10, one day later. The same day that they arrived in Albany, Hans's second son, Peter, was born. They then took a train to Florence, Nebraska, but not long after arriving in Florence on July 2nd, Hans's first son, Ooh. Ule, died at just over a year and a oh, half. Oh, yeah, that little kid from the picture. Just four days after the death of their son, Hans and his family left Florence, Nebraska with the John Franklin Sanders Company. Hans's group finally arrived at their destination from Nebraska. on September 5th, 1863. Well, it took these Three newcomers a little while to get set up, they were expected to become productive very quickly. Professor Dang, Henderson you just got done with this five-month journey. It's like, all right, guys, it's time to get to work. <laughs> about an interesting Start building them houses. speech given to a group of new arrivals, which highlights this sentiment. Brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been chosen from the world by God and sent through his grace Man, this into this valley beard, of the it's crazy. to help in building up his kingdom. You are faint and weary from your march. Rest then for a day, <laughs> for a second day, should you need it. Then rise up and you get see two how days. you will live. Be of good cheer. Look about this valley. Your first duty is to learn how to grow a cabbage. And along with this cabbage, I mean, an I, onion, a tomato. This is kind of important to be learning how, how to grow feed food. A pig, to build a house. The next duty for those who being Danes, French, and Swiss, but who cannot speak it now, is to learn the English language, the language of God, the language of the Book of Mormon, the language of the latter days. Hmm. So they went to different places around the state. Often in, they went to a particular place because that's where they had friends or relatives. This thing we call chain migration, mm, yeah. where you go where someone that you know uh, from the old country usually yeah, yeah, and you start lives, hopping. and they'll uh, put you up and help you get settled for a while. The family made their way to the town of Manti in San Pete County. Yeah, look at this. Utah. I mean, because Utah was still a territory right at this time, so it was, it was all broken up into weird pieces. A town which is about 100 maybe miles that is, south of Salt Lake This might be City. just county borders. These newcomers faced a few challenges in their new homes and assimilating into the overall culture of the area especially learning English. Yeah, I mean, I can't Professor even imagine coming from Denmark, going to rural Utah in the 1860s. Henriksen explained further. People who have studied this say they faced three three major enemies. Okay? One was Disease. the climate. Okay. They came from uh, Northern Europe. It was uh, 
cold? A, a lot more moist there. It was cooler. Now they're in the Great American Desert. Hmm. Another was uh, another enemy was the Native Americans, although they didn't have so much trouble getting along with them as they, as they thought they would. In fact, some of the Scandinavians learned more Indian language than they learned English. That's <laughs> hilarious. I mean, they weren't the that far en- away from the uh, Comanche, right? I mean, th- that would be t- pretty terrifying. Enemy was the English language. Hmm. And they, have, they really struggled with English, even though Danish and English are uh, rel- re- related languages with common Germanic ancestor. Yeah, and, I mean, I, it's not like learning, you know, going from like Chinese or Japanese to English. I mean, there, there's very little connection there. This is very important for them to be able to integrate into the communities, become part of the, the the kingdom of God in Utah. Brigham Young declared English was the language of God. I was mentioned the, here. The guy Social from BYU. linguists noted that different re- religious groups the guy, have the, often the regarded the particular language as central to their faith. And so for these Latter-day Saints, English was very important. It was the language of the Book of Mormon. It was the language of the gathering. I didn't and realize so how important English was to for the, the Mormons. Scandinavians that, that to makes sense. English. And they wanted to, but uh, that doesn't mean it was easy for them. Okay. Hans, Peter, and Lena would continue their work as musicians, and in 1866, Hans I like and how these two have the same the beards. Is that just the style? Musicians to fight in Black Hawk's War. Oh yeah, the war I've started heard about this. In 1865, but the conflicts between the Mormon pioneers and the Native Americans dated back to the 1840s. This guy got shades Relations on. Relations between the pioneers and natives were very peaceful at first. The Mormons wanted to be friendly and helpful to the natives because they saw it was in their own best interest. With Brigham Young once saying, "Because this had to been the style to, to shave your mustache, right?" Them. Even more so, the Mormons viewed Native Americans in a special light because the Mormons believed Native Americans were a lost tribe of Israel. Native Americans Hmm. viewed the Mormons as outcasts and were initially friendly with these pioneers. Relations slowly soured over the years and multiple massacres happened throughout the 1840s and 1850s, with Mormon pioneers even taking some Native Americans as slaves, including women and children. By the time Hans and his siblings had arrived, I mean, this is still Utah, before the slavery. Hundreds of Native Americans had already uh, 1865. been killed and enslaved, as well as eight Mormon settlers having been killed, four of whom had been Danish immigrants still on their journey from Denmark on a similar path that Hans mm. took. Things really began to get worse in the summer of 1863, right before Hans and his family would arrive. Oh, and wow. The family's first few years in Utah would include multiple fights between the settlers and Native Americans, eventually leading to Black Hawk's War. I basically found hmm. no reference to Hans and Peter's experiences in the war, with their biographies and obituaries mentioning this only as a small blurb. But their well, pension records that's probably show a good both thing. of them served for one year and eight months as musicians. Hans really? Were they the drummer boys? Oh, man. I was just making jokes about those memes. <laughs> when you're playing the, <laughs> when you're playing your flute and your homie gets shot in the chest, and you're like crying, but you still have to keep playing. They continued their focus on music by running choirs, orchestras, and other musical organizations throughout the area. They were constantly discussed in the newspaper and played multiple large events. This is a war Hans even followed in happening his father's within the Civil War teaching music to many students in the, the area time. and has said that he taught all the early day musicians in the Manti area. Hans and his wife Karen would have many children together, but at this time it was commonplace for men in the church to take multiple wives. Hans mm. was urged by his wife to take a second wife, which he did wow, in April 1869. Marrying Karen Elizabeth Hansen, and it would be through this marriage that Drew descends from Hans. Oh, dang. To the second wife. I also thought it was interesting that both of his wives were named Karen, and I imagine that must have been somewhat confusing throughout the house. Uh, I think that makes it a lot easier. (laughs) Karen wins dinner. They'll both give you answers. Hans and his second wife would have multiple children together, including Drew's ancestor, John Weston Scow. In looking for possible records for Hans's second marriage, I noticed that the registered date was actually October 10th, 1887. Hmm. This seemed quite odd, and I wanted to see if I could figure out why they would have a civil marriage 18 years after the original marriage. While I couldn't find anything indicating the exact reason, it seemed to be connected to the Edmunds Tucker Act of 1887. So they were not allowed to... The Edmunds Tucker Act was a law which attacked polygamy by going after the LDS Church and the Perpetual Emigration Fund. This law was actually an extension of a previous law from 1882 known as the Edmunds Anti-Polygamy Act. 
which basically Dang. banned polygamy and took away rights from polygamists, including voting, holding public office, and even serving on juries. The 1887 laws were enacted due to the lack of control the previous law had over polygamy. So mm. this new law disincorporated the church and the perpetual immigration fund. The perpetual immigration fund was the same fund which helped finance Lena Weston Scow's trip from Denmark. To ah, Utah. so they weren't sending. This law taking... also took away the rights of women to vote. That's Whoa. right. In Utah, from 1870 <laughs> oh, that's right. up I until did hear 1887, about this. women had the right to vote. A yeah. law which had been passed by the Utah they the Territorial first? Legislator. The Edmunds Tucker Act included all women, not just those in polygamous marriages. Hmm. I even found a public statement from famous women's suffrage fighter Susan B. Anthony opposing the bill and calling it obnoxious. Dang. One stipulation with this act was the requirement for civil marriage licenses. This is how I learned that it wasn't uncommon for Mormon couples to have a marriage recognized by the church, known as a celestial marriage, before they had a marriage recognized legally. Oh, yeah, the Edmunds by the government. Tucker Act became mm. law on March 3rd, 1887, and Hans officially married his second wife, Dang, Karen. There's so many newspaper just clips seven here. That's months amazing. Later in October found all these. Of 1887. While I don't have confirmation that this is the reason, it seemed likely. Hans's first wife died in 1884, just three weeks shy of oh. her 45th birthday. Hans's second wife took care of all the children. Nine children from the first marriage and three children from the second marriage. Dang, these kids look, they all have this same exact face. That's crazy. <laughs> that doesn't even look real. William Weston Scow, the youngest son from the first marriage, wrote about his stepmother saying, I can truthfully say that she was always a good mother to us. Wow. Hans would begin working in the Dang. Manti Temple in 1888, helping people with their genealogy. Hans's son, William, wrote that Hans was instrumental in obtaining genealogical records from the old country for many people in the area. In Hans's autobiography, he even boasts about having added over 2,000 names to the temple registry. Wow. And I think this adds a really interesting layer to yeah, the little, entire little story. Twist. And that a lot of the research and work Hans did in the temple likely helped preserve a lot of the family history researched for this video. Yeah, Hans that's crazy. Hans worked at the temple until his death in 1919 at the age of 83. Dang, he lived where he for was so long. described to have died from natural causes. 1919, man, this man, and this is the time period where people weren't necessarily living that long. Hans's right siblings, after World War I. Peter and Lena, would also lead very fulfilling lives with many descendants and a strong legacy. Peter died in 1911 at the age of 73 due to a heart disease, having a total of 19 children with two wives, Dang. 11 through his first marriage and eight through his second marriage. Dang. With all but two making it to adulthood. Lena would die in 1928 at the age of Overall, those are pretty good numbers. Old, Only two didn't make it. had 11 children with eight making it to adulthood. Wow. Drew had also done a DNA test, so I wanted to check out this line that we had built for the Weston Scow family against his DNA matches. Ooh. Just using through lines, Drew had 18 genetic matches who also descended from Drew's third great-grandfather, John Weston Scow. 42 matches through his fourth great-grandfather, Hans Weston Scow, and 60 matches through his fifth great-grandfather, Ule, the most recent ancestor of Drew's on this line, to have been born and died in Denmark. Dang. Helping confirm in everything Denmark. we had built for this part of Drew's family. So I got a cousin in Denmark. I gotta go find those fools. <laughs> If you enjoyed this video, be sure was to awesome. check I didn't know any of that. I guess I was only hinted at my you know, family's history from Utah. I actually still have a part of my family that lives in Utah. I know that. I'm going to try really hard to not be like one of those Americans that's just like, yo, I'm Danish now. Literally 100% Danish. Again, please go subscribe to this channel. That was an awesome video. Big thanks to my patrons. You'll find a link in the description down below to support me. The beautiful Megan Underwood. Drum your dad back with the milk. Look outside. A fat I normal. cannot sleep without Jack Drew's Draven's voice. Jack Draven's annoying Amateur archaeology. Carmel Frederick S. Sibling, Inquisitor Joey. Z. Serious. John Denver. Carino is Luxembourg best girl. Sammy, if you hear Robert this, e. I love Tambrin, you. The Great the Mexican 760. And Sandy Boy.